fucking liar, Ollie. Why would you lie? I just wanted to be a friend. The last few minutes of Saltburn radically recontextualize the story we've watched up until that point. But rather than successfully subverting audience expectations, I would argue that the film's grand finale simply invalidates everything that made the film so profound up until that point. So I present to you three reasons why the last seven minutes of Saltburn ruin an otherwise fantastic movie. The main reason that Saltburn's finale feels unnecessary is, well, because it is. Even if you like the ending, it's undeniable that the movie would still work if you removed it entirely, which I think is a bad sign. Well, that can't be good. It would still have a strong three-act structure, complete character arcs, compelling themes, and a big twist that recontextualizes everything. You see, this movie is the story of Oliver, one of the most compelling protagonists in recent cinema. At first, he seems to be just an awkward scholarship kid struggling to make friends. When he meets Felix, one of the most wealthy and charismatic students at Oxford, he's instantly obsessed. And while it's not clear whether his feelings are primarily romantic or platonic in nature, it's obvious that he'd do just about anything to stay in Felix's inner circle. Oliver claims to be the only child of two parents struggling with substance abuse, and when Felix grows distant towards the end of term, Oliver comes to him crying, saying that his father tragically passed away. Not wanting Oliver to have to return to a broken home, Felix invites him to spend the summer at Saltburn, and this is where the film really gets interesting. Initially, Act 2 seems to be more of what we saw in Act 1, Oliver awkwardly trying to fit in amongst those who are much more wealthy and privileged than he is. The mom views him as something to pity. How utterly, utterly tragic. The sister views him as one of Felix's playthings. You're just another one of his toys. And the father just views him as an excuse to throw a party. I can wear my suit for armor, Elspeth. But the two scenes that make up the midpoint suddenly force the audience to question whether everyone's view of Oliver, including our own, is even remotely correct. During a bout of rather awkward small talk, I was a lesbian for a while, you know. Oliver suddenly dons an air of confidence we've yet to see and blatantly flirts with Elspeth. Because you're so beautiful. But after Elspeth seems put off by his advance, he instantly changes course, shifting the conversation to Carrie Mulligan's character vilifying her in the process. You're absolutely right, there was actually something quite sinister about her. With just a few words, the protagonist goes from an awkward pushover to a charismatic manipulator. His goal in this moment is to ingratiate himself with Elspeth, and when complimenting her doesn't work, he doesn't hesitate to throw someone else under the bus. He knows that the best way to regain her trust is to make her distrust someone else, kind of like modern American politics. By making Pamela seem untrustworthy, Oliver is now seen by Elspeth as someone who is looking out for her family's best interest. Oh, thank goodness for you, Oliver. You're so perceptive. He can't be a threat if he's trying to protect them, right? Later that night, he dons the same air of confidence in order to seduce Felix's sister, which further deepens his entanglement with the family. For the rest of Act 2, Oliver feels like a legitimate member of the family, as well as an integral part of Saltburn itself. It's as if nothing could come between him and what he wants. Nothing, that is, except the truth. The first big twist of the movie, and the only one I think it needed, is that Oliver was lying this whole time. It was me, Barry. When Felix takes Ollie to visit his mom, it's revealed that Oliver is actually from a happy, upper-middle-class family. He's not an only child, and his father is still very much alive. Much to Felix's dismay, Oliver is a pathological liar, and this is what makes all but the last seven minutes so fantastic. The protagonist is willing to do and say anything to get what he wants. He's not satisfied with the reality of his own existence, so he simply invents a new one. It's it's not like Marta in Knives Out, where we root for her and rejoice when she eventually takes ownership of the house. We're not meant to view Oliver as being better than the people he's surrounded by, because he's just as bad. Everyone in this narrative is a liar to one degree or another. Oliver crafts the most explicit web of lies, but the entire family is constantly clawing at a false reality. Whether it's commenting on the weather instead of acknowledging that Farley was kicked out of the house, I think he's even hotter than last year, or discussing font choice for a grave instead of acknowledging their grief, The Times New Roman. On local stone. No one at Saltburn is honest with themselves. Their entire existence is a conscious and constantly maintained lie. So how is it any worse that Oliver lied to be a part of it? 
Felix considers it to be the ultimate deception, but as Oliver points out, Look, I just gave you what you wanted! Felix wanted a charity case. He wanted someone he could pity and rescue. It's alluded to constantly that Felix views his friends as temporary and disposable. If Oliver really was just a plaything, what does it matter who he pretended to be? Farley, who antagonizes Oliver the most throughout the film, actually answers this question at the beginning of the movie. It's completely valid to debate the rhetoric of an argument. It's not what you argue, but how. In a world where keeping up appearances is the top priority, all that matters is what appears to be true. Farley constantly tries to make Ollie feel like he doesn't belong. It's my house. I always come back. But is that actually the case? When Felix's parents are eating breakfast, refusing to acknowledge the death of their own son, Oliver is the only young person in the room who engages with them. I don't normally like chocolate cake. Yes, it can be cloying, can't it? By this point in time, Oliver knows what performance he's expected to put on, and he plays his part beautifully. Farley, who supposedly belongs at Saltburn, can't keep up appearances. But look just cold. <laughs> Despite believing himself to be more entitled to Saltburn, it's Oliver who fully integrates into the family. When Venetia questions the validity of Oliver's grief, she points out, You only knew him for six months? But did she actually know her brother? Or was she just familiar with the persona he maintained? How is it any less valid for Oliver to grieve his idea of Felix? Even if you argue that these things are morally equivalent, what place does morality have at Saltburn? The controlled anarchy of the aristocratic lifestyle depicted in this film necessitates survival of the fittest. And seeing as Oliver is the last one standing, does he not deserve Saltburn? At the very least, he's just as entitled to it as the other characters in the film. This is the conclusion that the first hour and 58 minutes of Saltburn come to. It's not a simple eat the rich narrative like has become popular nowadays. It's a grim, satirical, and nuanced perspective that few stories dare to take. So how does the last seven minutes change that? Well, the big reveal is that Oliver is a mustache twirling villain who orchestrated the murder or downfall of everyone in the movie. It was me, Barry. It's no longer a compelling examination of entitlement and identity, but rather a simple thriller that is more style than it is substance. By maniacally murdering his way to the top of Saltburn, he's actively worse than the people he's surrounded by, which undercuts the moral ambiguity that made the film so intriguing in the first place. I think it's worth mentioning at this point how the director's background might have prompted the inclusion of this final twist. Emerald Fennell, the writer and director, is named Emerald because her father was a successful jewelry designer. She comes from a wealthy background, and I think this might have influenced the ending we got. The uber wealthy don't get a happy ending in this movie, but the last seven minutes explicitly turn Oliver into the bad guy. In my opinion, this makes the film feel utterly toothless. Rather than making a bold and provocative statement, the ending just sort of exists for the sake of the twist. In the place of meaningful commentary, you're left with, well, I bet you didn't see that coming. Whereas the first twist meaningfully enhanced the story, the final twist just shows that the director is afraid of two things, ambiguity and the middle class. Speaking of which, ambiguity is one of the most powerful elements in storytelling. It encourages engagement and invites interpretation. A piece of literature like Hamlet isn't studied across the world because it's inherently better than every other piece of writing. It's examined over and over again because you can understand it through wildly different lenses every single time. For this very reason, though, filmmakers are often terrified by ambiguity. Your film is no longer just your film. It's also the different films each and every audience member perceived it to be. Emerald Fennel only wants a single version of Saltburn to exist. As a result, the film beats you over the head with exposition in the finale so that we know without a doubt that Oliver masterminded just about every major event in the film. Now, even though I don't like the choice to make Ollie a killer, there were much better ways ways to allude to this fact without undermining the clever subtlety that characterized most of the film. If the finale just used these key bits of dialogue, I can honestly say that these last few months have been the happiest of my life. It's just such a shame you got so well. It's been a privilege to look after you, just as it'll be a privilege to look after Saltburn. 
then cut to the funeral, there would still be the same sinister implication without the lingering stench of condescension. But using flashbacks to explicitly show each and every moment Oliver did something leaves nothing to the imagination and prevents the audience from engaging with the film in meaningful ways after leaving the theater. On top of that, the on-the-nose reveal causes the film to run into a phenomenon I call the exposition event horizon. Essentially, the more you try to explain things in a film, the more audiences are going to question them. John Wick doesn't try to explain how the criminal economy actually works, so the audience doesn't really care that everything seems to just cost one gold coin. However, when Rise of Skywalker explicitly addresses why the Holdo maneuver can't be replicated, the audience suddenly questions whether or not this explanation is valid. If a movie crosses the exposition event horizon, it better have answers for everything. My biggest question is how did Oliver keep his family a secret once he reunited with Elspeth? Obviously, he avoided contact with them for most of Act 2, but are we really supposed to believe that they wouldn't reach out once Ollie moved back to Saltburn? Felix's family has all sorts of connections, but the movie thinks it's possible that not a single person would look into his background, especially once Elspeth decides to leave Saltburn to him. If the movie had remained ambiguous at the end, I wouldn't be so nitpicky, but when filmmakers leave only one possible possible interpretation, it better be a logical one. The final reason that the finale ruins the movie is because it just doesn't make sense for the character. Oliver is a pathological liar, but the big twist turns him into a Bond villain, which just doesn't line up with everything we've seen up until that point. Ollie will do whatever he needs to get what he wants, but he also shows signs of empathy and remorse. Watch his expression when he learns what happened to Pamela. I'm a dying. Yeah. To do anything for attention. He clearly feels conflicted, knowing that his vilification of Pamela played a part in her eventual death. I'm not saying he wouldn't do it again, but he certainly doesn't gleefully revel in the tragedy like he does in the finale. Behind all the lies and manipulation, there is a level of kindness found within Oliver. He legitimately seems to care about others, and it's only once they get in his way that he treats them like obstacles. The character we see in those final moments is completely removed from the Oliver seen throughout the rest of the movie. Some of you are probably typing a comment right now that says, actually, he's an unreliable narrator so it makes sense that the two characters feel totally different, and you'd be right, except Oliver is quite literally the narrator of this film. His voiceover is diegetic, implying that the whole movie is just Ollie recounting the events to Elspeth. We got there in the end, didn't we? If this is the case, it doesn't make sense for him to portray himself in a more sympathetic or positive manner because he ultimately reveals the truth. What's the point of keeping the audience in the dark? Suspense? His only audience member is a woman in a coma. There are plenty of moments that utilize the unreliable narration brilliantly. When we see Ollie get this phone call, then immediately cut to him telling Felix his dad died, the audience assumes the phone call was him getting the bad news. But when the first twist reveals that he was lying, it becomes clear why we didn't actually hear what was discussed during the call. It's a conscious and brilliant manipulation on Oliver's part that would work great if there was only one twist, but doesn't make any sense in the context context of the finale. It only exists to fool the audience and serves no purpose within the world of the story. This could have been avoided if the narration was revealed to be part of a, say, police interrogation, but Elspeth is on life support, dude. She can't really appreciate complicated story structure. Whether the filmmakers were too afraid of their own commentary, or just didn't believe that one big twist was enough, the last seven minutes turned Saltburn into a completely different movie. One that might be more shocking, but is it actually better? You tell me. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.